Welcome, welcome to another bonus episode of Amber Chats, where we talk to someone in the community and discuss various topics surrounding the game we all love, Frosthaven. I'm your host, Eddie. Joining me as always for the Amber Chats is Gaz. And he's going to say hi, Gaz. Hi, Gaz. Okay. Yeah. Very exciting. And our main guest for today. He's the second greatest Frosthaven player to hail from Seattle, Washington. His favorite character was and might still be the Geminate, but last I heard he was fooling around with a trap behind the Geminate's back. He's the main investor and playtester of up and coming Spiel de Jar's winning game Ellis Haven, which, and more excitedly, we get to be the first Melbourne based, dirt titled podcast ever to learn all about this incredibly exciting game. The newest member of the gang who sang and rang, causing a clang with his fang. Let's start with a bang. Dang. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me on. I was very curious on how you were going to say my name with the two Gs, <laughs> right? Is it dang G, dang gaga? Because originally it was just D-A-N-G, right? Mm -hmm. And my last name starts with G. And when I would work like in industries, like as a server bartender, your tickets would print out with your first name and your last initial. So that's where I got the nickname Dang. Um, but then when you start gaming, right, particularly like video games, I play Tecmo Super Bowl still 30 years later. I play that wow. online a lot. And you say GG when it's all done. And so that's somebody right. just recommended I add the G to make it Dang GG. So depending on where you're coming from, it's Dangaga or Dang GG. <laughs> oh, I we went with Dangaga because it just sounded like it was the wrong way of doing it. And that means it's the right way of doing <laughs> That's it. That's what we've been saying, like leading up to is like, I remember we're um, uh, jumping on a chat with Dangaga and uh, I'm glad that it's Dang though. <laughs> I mean, either way it works. It's whatever gets the most laughs is always the answer from my perspective. Absolutely. I and mean, when we had the... Um, our, you became one of our most recent pets with uh, the spitting trach that you know we we caught, Love and it was kind of like, do we actually write? Do we actually write down Dan and then G G? Which I'm spelling as G U H G U H because <laughs> you need to put a lot of emphasis on the G G. And uh, no, I think it's a very flexible name. Uh, it's a very strong name, and I'm almost certain, like, I've met people with that as a surname. Or but, like G -G? Dang. No, just Dang. Oh, just Dang. Yeah. Oh. I mean, if, yeah. and if it's a spitting drake, I guess that would be the noise that spitting <laughs> drake makes when it spits, right? So if you're going to use the pet, you have to go, 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 go poison. I like that. It. <laughs> That's amazing. I need a sound bite that. <laughs> so I did some research quickly on Seattle, Washington. We've obviously, in our Discord, had a chat about different locations. And 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 look, and their chats is all kind of becoming a little bit like a geography lesson for us because we learn a lot about the world and where everyone's from. Um, and lately we've, you know, had a few guests from the United States. So Seattle seems to be the place that like Gaz and I will move to if we had to move to a location because it's the most similar to Melbourne. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, I actually was really lucky. I, I visited Australia 25 years ago, right at the end of high school. We have had, we have had some sort of drama group from Australia somehow, like the drama teacher at our school knew someone who taught drama in Australia. And they came and we hosted them and, and all the, the group of, you know, 15, 20 kids, whatever it was. And then they went around to all these different schools in our area and put on their show. And so we did an exchange thing where a couple later, a couple of years later, our high school sent a group down there and I got chosen to be part of that group. So we were down there and I was down there for a week in Melbourne, a week in Sydney and five days at the end in what I was always told to pronounce as cans. Not Carnes, but Cans. Yeah, I was, cans. I was, yeah, that's I was right. Very cans. explicitly told that's Cans. Uh, and I remember when I was there in Melbourne. I mean, I was you know seventeen, eight years, eighteen years old. But I just remember feeling a sense of yeah, this feels a lot like home. So make your way up here. I'll show you around town. Yeah, I do want to visit. Sounds good. All right. Well, when we do the Amdirt World Tour, uh, we'll uh, and hit up all the cons. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make sure that we drop by Seattle. So Seattle, I, I you know, do some research, having a look, etc. So we got, we got. Now, correct me if I'm wrong with any of this, right? So we got, we got Space Needle, mm -hmm. which is that that giant spiky spiky thing. So that that's Seattle. 
Mm -hmm. uh, birthplace of, I think, Jimi Hendrix, Nirvana, and Pearl Jam. And I think there's a, a pretty insane music scene in Seattle. I think, what, what, do they, do they, I think it was grunge? Grunge became one oh, of the yeah. biggest things there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that, is that Alice, still true? Alice in Chains, Soundgarden, Mud Honey, yeah, then those were all based out of Seattle. Stone Temple Pilots, not based out of Seattle, even though everyone thought they were part of that group, but they were not. Uh, but yeah, no, huge. And then uh, a decent amount of hip hop. Sir Mix a Lot is a Seattle guy, uh, which is a great sense of pride. And then there was a pretty decent indie scene there for a while with like Modest Mouse and Death Cab for a Cutie, all kind of coming out of this area as well. So Seattle's always had a pretty, pretty solid music scene. Of course, I'm a more of a classic rock 70s. I mean, I love grunge. Don't get me wrong. I grew up with it. But like Heart is from Seattle, which is also a huge source of pride for us. So a lot of good music from our area. Yeah. Guys, you like that, don't you? Yeah, that sounds great. No, but you're, you're a grungy guy. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, like it was, um, I was probably a little bit young when the Hong Kong grunge thing was happening, although I probably got more into the punk side of things. So that was like the like California Bay punk scene, which I was always liking all those bands that were popping up there. But yeah, it's really cool to hear like the roots of all, you know, those kind of bands and they're more coming together and it makes sense as well. Like when you see a whole bunch of bands that don't, not that are similar, but all kind of like create this wave of music and they all come from like the same kind of area. You can just imagine they're all just like hanging out, catching up with each other and stuff like that. <laughs> oh, and there are a lot nice. of them shared shared members throughout the history of them too with um i mean members of alice in chains and pearl jam uh did uh <clears throat> mad season um and then temple of the dog was a combination of everything so it was all sorts of bands kind of mixed and matched and i think even chris cornell the lead singer of uh soundgarden his wife i think uh well not at the time but became wife was the manager of alice in chains like it was all just mm. It, it was all intertwined, yeah. There we go. So now we've got geography and music lessons on the Amdev podcast. Hell so you yeah. come here to learn, right? Like, oh yeah. So did, I mean, what, what's Frost over right? We don't need that anymore. <laughs> uh, it's also the birthplace of Starbucks, which I'm almost certain has taken over the world. Um, we've definitely got heaps of them here, and they're always full, despite Melbourne being a relatively big known ca uh, coffee capital of the world. So I think, That's um, you know, that's a yeah, little bit so, so I, I have no problem admitting this one because I'm I'm childish and petty. It's a little bit of a sensitive topic towards some Seattleites because Howard Schultz, the founder of Starbucks, owned the Seattle Supersonics, the basketball team here, and he was the one that sold them to the investor group that moved them to Oklahoma City. Uh Ooh. and we have not had a basketball team for uh coming up on 20 years now. And myself and many other people have not set foot in a Starbucks since that happened. The great oh, yeah. thing is there's plenty of other really good coffee in the area, so not hurting for options on that. But Wow. Well, yeah, if anyone can um, put together a basketball team for Seattle, can you hit us up and we will um, <laughs> organize that for, for Seattle? <laughs> Um, I, I haven't gone to a Starbucks in as long as I can remember, but I will continue my boycott. Yes. I knew there was a reason I wasn't going there, right? Yes. Uh, now I'll just continue to not go. And if anyone does, I'll even walk past and go, get out of there. Love it. Oh, you <laughs> just endured with yourself you to half the city. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there were two final things that I looked into. All right. One of them is Seattle, and this is maybe a complete thing that everyone knows, but it sounds really far-fetched to me. So Seattle sits on top of an underground ghost town. Mm -hmm. So there was a great Seattle fire of 1889, which occurred, yep. and mm -hmm. it changed the city forever. So what, did they just build the city again, but like above it or so something along those so, lines? So one of the things that you will have to do when you come to Seattle is there is an underground tour. Um, and it's kind of a long story short, but essentially there's, you know, huge hills, massive hills in Seattle. And they knew the hills were actually too steep to, to really kind of live on. So they essentially, what they did is they knew they were going to grade the town and kind of build it up so the hills weren't as steep. And the Great Seattle Fire was kind of part of it. You'll learn all the details when you take the tour. But in essence, when they built all the buildings, they told everyone, make your main entrance on the second floor because we're eventually going to bury the ground floor. So they did, but you can still go underground and see like these old, old, old 
first story entrances wow. that essentially got buried when they made the hills less steep than they are now. And there's ghosts. Well, of course there is. Yeah, I mean this is okay. Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. It's I'm picturing it from like a some kind of weird post-apocalyptic kind of world under there where you know you got little scavengers and maybe some zombies and all that kind of stuff, right? That tell me that's exactly what it's like. Well, I mean, I would imagine that Isaac toured and did the underground tour, and that was at least partially responsible for the inspiration for Gloom Maven. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. just my assumption. I can sort of yeah, I can sort of see that. So there was no fire? Seattle fire? No, there was. There was a yeah, huge massive fire. But that since it kind of tore down it gave the city sort of the ability to rebuild. And when they rebuilt, they said, let's do it in this way. Got you. Kind of take this opportunity. I mean, that's, I'm kind of oversimplifying it in a way, but. Yeah, of course. No, it's important because we're consistently now with the US cities that we're talking to, there seems to be some featured fire somewhere. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And um, like last year, we, no, sorry, last session we learned about um, the Cleveland river river that the river. fire oh yeah <laughs> yeah it's just it's just now becoming a, a fire education i love thing. it yeah it's like there's I a turning even... point in every u.s city's history where a fire happens and then they, they go all right let's do something better because of fire i mean i don't even i i used to live in seattle proper but a few years ago we moved out to a town just outside of seattle called bothell and it was the same thing downtown was on fire and they basically rebuilt downtown, but they took it as an opportunity to, hey, let's actually build like a proper downtown and they've done a really nice job with it. So, I mean, that's the cycle of life, growth and death, right? Just yeah. Yeah. with buildings, I guess. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> I think um, Melbourne might need one, maybe on the Monash or something. Oh uh, yeah, so they to make it even it. slower. Yeah. yeah, yeah, something like that. All right, let's talk about your gaming world, the world of gaming. What yes. got you into it? What are your favorites? Like, what, what, give me some, uh, give me some games. Yeah. So I grew up in a family. Um, uh, my grandmother raised me. Uh, she had legal custody of me. So I was raised, even though I was the oldest grandchild and all the grandchildren were at home. Uh, my uncle, who was only nine years older than me, he and I shared a room growing up. So he might be, he was kind of like half uncle, half older brother. Yeah. And so he was really into board games. He was really into kind of D and D type of things, uh, Warhammer, that kind of thing. And so as a kid, you know, young kid, we would play Life and Monopoly and Mousetrap and all those games that you play as a kid. You know, in the eighties, those were the games that were available. But the first game that really got me out of that was watching my uncle play his favorite game with all of his friends. And I know this is going to make your day because it turned into one of my favorite games of all time. And, and I ended up playing it for years and years and years with my best friends. I have the fourth edition with every expansion pack, uh, which is Talisman. Right. Everybody's Hell favorite yes. game. Hey, you're, the, you're like me. I've got the fourth edition with every expansion pack yes. as well. Just sitting there. Yeah. I mean, not gathering dust. It's just on a pedestal somewhere. I, I remember an early podcast where uh, a Gaz, I believe you were... Um, saying some words about talisman and and i put that away uh in my head to bring back at a later date <laughs> to be fair he but, played the star wars version um that's different. because we yeah, yeah very different uh, through. probably <laughs> slightly better i don't know <laughs> i'm sure it's a great game yeah i mean it, it was you know it was something different you know i i saw some kind of video on youtube one time that was like the 100 games you have to play and one of the games they listed was talisman and their justification for it was essentially was it's the better version of monopoly mm. because it is all about collecting resources and the more resources you collect the more dominant you are and the more likely other players who are in, in the game will have to sort of you know succumb to you yeah. being as dominant as you are um and so to a certain extent that makes sense you know, as a kid, we were really drawn towards, like, the fantasy things, right? Like, mm. me and my friends, um, my two best friends, David and Darren. I mean, we used to play it all the time, and I was always the thief. That was always my favorite character. Darren was always the elf, and David was always the wizard. Those were our three favorite characters. But then we would start to institute house rules to play other games, and we would track it all. And so that was really kind of the game that got me beyond the scope of kind of the original games. Yeah, it's um, uh, oh, go for sorry. It. Oh, I was going to say, it's uh, it's interesting because like the, a game like that, it's making that parallel comparison to Monopoly is, uh, you know, you, I've started playing games with my kids who uh, like 
seven and nine. So, you know, and they enjoy, uh, I won't say simple games, but it's like the amount of agency that they require in their game is substantially lower than what I require. So they're happy to just uh, do the actions and the motions of playing the game. And that's fun. And I remember playing Monopoly, like loving it as a kid, like in a lot of those games. So it's, it, it is really interesting. Whereas it's something like Talisman. And when I played it, I think it's like kind of, uh, we're past uh, that small amount of agency and we want more in a game, like more decisions. We want our decisions to matter. And, and so it's not so much that it's a bad game. It's just like, for the space that you're in, certain games aren't going to appeal you, to you because they're just not, I, I don't want to say not made for you, but they're not giving you the thing you want. You've kind of leveled up past that. Um, so it's, it's but that comparison is really interesting because I haven't thought about that. And um, yeah, it's it's really true. So maybe I should get a borrow talisman. <laughs> and I think one of the, the key things about it too is that as a kid, you know, most of the games, they're very, obviously they're very simple because they need to be. But theme-wise, they don't take risks or take you anywhere. They're all very basic, right? And they were all intended to be very basic. But Talisman really gets you into theme. It, for for like for me, it was one of my true first introductions to like a fantasy world, right? With some basic concepts like strength, craft, ca casting spells, you know, monsters that you see in everything now, which is like ogres and goblins and giants and things like that. Like that was my first real introduction to mm -hmm. those kinds of things. And I think just because of that being so important to me, it's one of the reasons why for me, theme and kind of what the game is trying to accomplish from that perspective is so important to me, way more than mechanics. I mean, mechanics are obviously important, but the theme of the game really draws me in uh, pretty significantly and i think that's a lot of where that came from yeah i mean i mean all those things you're saying make sense i didn't play it as a kid i played it probably well into my collection of the hobby and when i first played it i was just like this is i i loved it i and i played you know better games um or or more you know complex games than it but for some reason the the chaos of it the randomness of it and yeah the theme i i was almost getting a real nostalgic hit without experiencing that nostalgia so it was, it was a weird thing. And I, I love the fact that, like you say, it, it's infinitely house rulable as well because of the, how simple, I guess, it is. Which, from a child point of view, which is kind of what you want to do, use your imagination. These are your characters. Hell, you can do whatever the hell you want. And you have endless game right there for, for growing up. And so I mean, when I we think would do it, I mean, you know, I would go over, David and Darren lived uh, a block away from each other. And so I would go over to one of their houses on Friday night and I'd stay until till Sunday because um, we had a full house. So my, my family, my grandmother was happy to have someone out of the house, like one less kid to have to maintain. So I would just disappear for the weekend and we would have, you know, whatever that is, 36, 48 hours. And we would just do these marathon games, 15, 16 years old. We were just building all sorts of house rules and just long-term tournaments that we were managing and it was it really helped with our sort of creativity it fit it fit our personalities really well it's um i was just having a look then uh because the the game that got me into that fantasy stuff probably was hero quest or well, dark world before that but hero quest so around that and i just had a look at the release dates and hero quest came out in 89 and i was just looking and talisman first and second edition were before that both of them i think 83 was first edition and second edition it's saying here was like 80 so like it's interesting that that's kind of the lead up to there like i didn't play those games but i mean i probably would have if you know 10 years earlier or if they come out a little a little bit later so uh yeah it's kind of like where's your entry point into that whole mm -hmm. fantasy world and that's that's what opened the door for me for all that stuff right and that's i think when i got into D, &D why it was so exciting yeah um and now it's translating down to your you know yeah. young one it's kind of it's kind of neat. He's uh, so I have a seven year old, and he has kind of watched me play, right? Like, because oftentimes we'll we'll meet at my house. I have a nice table for us to get fully set up on, and he is just endlessly. He was just endlessly fascinated by the game, and he's got one of these brains where he can't remember where his shoes are, but he will remember. He's seen me with a card, and he'll remember the initiative on it and exactly how what the attack is and the exact range and all these things. He just memorizes this stuff so he was I, a couple of times we'd have have the guys over we'd play the game for a little bit and he would talk about it and so i thought well he seems to understand the kind of concepts 
why don't we give Jaws of the Lion a try? It's relatively simple. Um, I had never played through that. I'd done a full Blue Maven campaign, done a couple of them, but I had never done a full Jaws of the Lion campaign. So I bought it, and he took the hatchet, which probably is the simplest character of the four. Maybe the Red Guard, but I thought it would be good for me to play the Red Guard to have a little bit more sort of control over the battlefield. And he took right to it, and it's just sort of exploded for him. And and now we just, uh, a month and a half ago, started a Gloomhaven campaign with him at seven years Fantastic. old. And he, he can't get enough of it. It's great. It's been, uh, I never would have expected that, uh, but it's certainly uh, a wonderful welcome surprise for me hell yeah yeah that's crazy so you started with talisman i started with hero quest and alice is starting with Just Blue Haven. Line, Blue Haven. yeah <laughs> I mean, wow we did, play, we did have some we bought some of the kid games there's games i think it's called like outfoxed and you know uh dragamino which is like a kid's version of kingdomino um and a couple other games like that 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 were more than just you know what we grew up with as the kids' games like Mousetrap mm. and that kind of stuff, um, and he always seemed to really enjoy it. And so Jaws of the Lion, I think, like you said, was his transition past those sort of real, more simplistic child's games. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, and I like that you even you're aware of it enough to actually think about that exact class choice kind of thing. Because if let's just hypothetically, you were like, hey, you know, let's play Frosthaven now. Um, and he's just like, I want to, you know, this one looks really cool. This bug looking thing, <laughs> um, you know, you've thought about it enough to make sure that you can make sure that he can get the most out of the game and enjoy it without, you know, this is, I'm so confused and, you know, and, and turned off by the idea is that. Yeah, we did. We did a full right. campaign with uh, myself, my wife and, and, and him, and she was the void warden. I was the red guard and, and he was the, the hatchet. So now that it's over though, he and I have free time. So we started up a, a second two-player campaign through Jaws of the Lion, and he is taking on the Demolitionist, and I'm taking on the Hatchet, because I wanted to see what that was like. And he was playing the Hatchet while I was playing the Trap in Frosthaven, so he fell in love with the Demolitionist cards that allow you to lay traps, but he doesn't quite understand monster AI enough. Got so you. he's laying all these traps all over the board that never get touched. And so <laughs> uh, I, that, that, I that, mean, it's nice to help him remember like, hey, there's still more you got to learn here. It's maybe not uh, quite as easy as you thought it was with the hatchet. Well, there's, there's two different parts you could go there. Because one of yeah. them is like, you just kind of go, oh, look what ran into that trap. Oh, it's done. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it's, um, it's funny though with you you know you kind of starting gloomhaven with him because you're playing a gloomhaven campaign with him right yeah so that one yeah. we're doing uh me him and then my sister-in-law my wife's sister uh is into D D, so we're doing that to try and get him a little time with her as well so it's kind of yeah. nice to create some family memories because i reckon that gloomhaven while not easy and it is complex is probably a lot of people's uh like adult people's kind of gateway into a game of that size. Like I imagine that there were people that were like, Hey, oh, there's this cool dungeon crawler game that's come out and it's really fun with experience. And they're probably drawn people in who maybe were new to it because Gloomhaven does have a pretty, I'll say it's pretty low barrier for entry. If you've got someone that understands the rules, like yeah. if you've got someone to run the game, it kind of does allow you to go. There are simple classes that are like, you really just got to pick two cards, right? Like that's it. You're not having to manage multiple different resources. So it is probably uh, a good one for kids compared to say Frosthaven, where a lot of the classes have way more moving parts that you need to consider. Like always, otherwise your things don't work, like your resources and extra things on cards. So uh, thinking about Gloomhaven as the entry point is actually really interesting. Yeah, ironically, in that party, I'm the brute, the easiest character to play, and then my kid is playing the Spellweaver, and my sister-in-law is playing the Mind Thief, which is a great party. Mm -hmm. uh, I just happen to have the easiest one to manage, which I guess frees up brain space to help manage Monster AI and the rest of it. That's it. Uh, your, um, your kid also has designed scenarios. Yeah. Uh, is you know, which is which is pretty amazing to be able it's, to do. Can you give me a standout like yeah. scenario that you've had? So it's it's one of the coolest things. So the after maybe two or three times of my friends coming over to play, he would go up for dinner, right? So he'd go upstairs and he and mom are sitting there and have dinner while we're all down here playing. And I go up one night after the game and 
he had convinced my wife to get out a piece of paper and they drew like a map that very clearly had mimicked what we were doing. And he was like designing essentially a Frost Haven scenario and they called it Ellis Haven. Um, which I mean, you know, look, we've got Gloomhaven, we've got Frost Haven, we might as well go to Ellis Haven on the next one. And, you know, much of it was mimicking. But as he got older and started to learn more about the game, he did, which is really when you find out about game designers, he's doing it at a very simplistic level, but he's doing what game designers do, which is they take elements from all these sort of disparate games and merge them into a new thing. So he got really, he loves watching me play. I love to play retro games. I'm really big into like the 8-bit Nintendo and the 16-bit Super Nintendo. Um, and so I love Mega Man, right? And so he would watch me play Mega Man. And now he, he got into Mega Man and started playing Mega Man. So he created an Ellis Haven scenario that was a Mega Man themed one where there was, I think it was like six or seven different rooms. And in each room, there was a boss that you had to fight, just like you would in Mega Man. And when you defeated the boss, you would get that boss's special ability to use, just like you would in Mega Man, that you would then use against the boss in the next room. Because mm. that, whatever you had gained, if it was a fire ability, the next monster was made of ice. So if you use your fire ability, obviously the ice is weak to that. You beat that boss, you get the ice ability, you go into the next room, the next one is weak to ice. He would just incorporate all these things. He got some magic cards. He learned very basic how to play Magic the Gathering, and he started using magic cards as like summons on the board once he saw that you could have summons. And so he just keeps incorporating all these disparate <laughs> elements and these scenarios keep getting just bigger and bigger and bigger and more complex to the point where uh you know we'll 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 play the scenario with him and we'll have it'll be a six hour scenario i mean one hour at a time because we're not willing to sit there for that long uh we, we put the paper over it to cover it but six sessions of one hour because we've got such a huge and he's he's got with the section book where he's created the next room but it's on a separate piece of paper and he doesn't connect it until we open the door and wow he just he goes to town on it and it's uh it's one of those things i think every parent can relate to this where you are incredibly impressed you're so proud of it and my god please don't make me sit through another hour of it. <laughs> <laughs> That passion, though, that passion, excitement, enthusiasm is like, you, you can't even create that. It's just, it's, that is so cool. Yeah, it's it's definitely one of the most memorable things that's happened to me in terms of fatherhood is, is seeing that come come alive that way. And I mean, even, even just this morning, you know, he, he's supposed to wake up at 7 a.m. We get ready. He I drop him off at summer camp on my way to work. I woke up to go wake him up and his door's already open and he's in his room on the ground drawing coloring in he's building another scenario he's waking up before he's supposed to because he's got all the stuff rattling in his head he's got to get it out onto the paper like it's it's very very cool yeah that's awesome yeah i can't wait to hear about the evolution and you know in 10 years 20 years time he's owning and uh, some big board game publishing thing you know he's overtaken critical role like just and we can interview him out. that's right we're like i knew you before you were famous before you even knew you were famous <laughs> yeah so true all right let's, first father um, son duo to be interviewed yeah hell yeah all right let's move on to um frost haven which yep. is uh obviously what our podcast is all about so you are uh, believe you've got two two running at the moment is that what you said yeah and how so far into four... into it are you yeah, so I've got a four-player campaign that's kind of the main campaign. So I had mentioned, you know, my best friends, David and Darren. Um, and then there's a, the guy that I met in college. Uh, actually, we were filming a movie. I made a, a movie in college that I was the assistant director, director of photography, so I did the camera work on, called The Gamers. And it was literally, it's about D&D, &D, right? Guys gaming, and you can actually find it on YouTube. And we had a ton of fun making that film. And, and um, one of the people that I got to know kind of through that and, Kind of mutual friends and everything with a, a guy named travis and we've stayed in contact you know after college i moved over, out to boston for a few years when i came back we we got back together so the four of us have kind of created this campaign and so 
we're kind of, you know, we live 20, 30, up to an hour and a half away from each other. So it, it takes a little time for us to get together. But we've got a four-player campaign there going that we've started, uh, that we're almost at the end of the second winter on. Uh, one of the big delays, too, is I had back surgery last year. So that put me out of commission for uh, a couple of months. So we got mm. delayed on that. And then uh, one of the two players in there, my friend Darren, he and I are super into it. And we have started a two-player campaign that we play fully online on full stack. And what's been really nice about that is that we have been able to make the opposite choice of what we've done in the oh, four-player yeah. campaign. So, you know, for example, right at the beginning in the four-player campaign, we sided with the Snow Dancer uh, and took down, took down Big Fisty. Uh, so then in our two-player campaign, we sided with the fist and took down the snow dancer. So we've been able to see kind of the disparate pathways um, and make different choices to experience more of the game. And because there's so many different ways that you can build characters, um, we're just about to get to a point where we're going to have finally, I've you know seen a character played in one game and also seen that character played in the other game but played in a very different style, which is part mm. of the replayability from my perspective of the, the Haven games, which is great. Yeah, hundred um, percent. And I do have to share, this is one of my favorite things. So your podcast, actually, I love the fact that you name the pets after members of the community. It's a great way to get them incorporated, but your podcast actually inspired the name of my first character in our two player campaign. So one of your original characters was a death walker and the thing that i just absolutely always loved the way you called the death walker the shadow poopa <laughs> the shadow poopa just pooping shadows everywhere <laughs> it is is the shadow poopa so in seattle uh we have a baseball team and one of the big players <laughs> on our baseball team his name is Cal raleigh and his nickname is Big Dumper, uh, which is possibly the greatest nickname in the history of sports. Yeah. When, he, when he was when he was in the minor leagues, when he got called up to the big leagues, one of his teammates, Jared Kelnick, posted on the Instagram post, "Way to go! Let's go get him, Big Dumper," which was the first any of us heard heard it. But we saw that, and of course, we just thought it was the greatest thing, and it took off like wildfire um, among the fan base, and eventually the official, you know marketing team kind of picked it up and it's become his nickname big dumper <laughs> so when i started the the death walker in my two-player campaign i named it cal raleigh <laughs> <laughs> wow i wow. love those uh those type of nicknames or those naming conventions um but you've actually just reminded me because that was so long ago right like i completely forgot that about the death walker and the shadow pooper right like uh, so it's uh, taking me back memory. It's a memory lane in that that fight, that world. So that's awesome. It could be an inspiration. Hundred uh, percent. I love stories like that as well. Um, let's talk a little bit about characters, right? In terms of mm -hmm. classes and all that kind of stuff. Now you've already given me a list of things you you know how you've progressed and what you haven't had. What have you played personally? So I started with the Geminate, um, which I named oh, okay. Grant uh, in honor of NBA legends. Harvey Grant and Horace Grant. So when I was in melee form, I was Horace Grant. And when I was in ranged form, I was Harvey Grant. So every uh -huh. time I would be in melee form, my teammates would encourage me to get physical in the paint uh, with, with <laughs> Horace Grant, which was great. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, and then when I retired my Geminate, I went to the trap, which I loved, um, really loved the trap. Uh, that's another thing. One of the th things that I really enjoy about the way that we play our games is whether it's intentional or subconscious we've sort of created our own lore within the haven world of our campaign Love it. so every vermling has uh, travis had started uh, his, our very first campaign as the mind thief and he named that character squeeps uh for the um he and peel sketch about the silly names of the east west coast players so squeeps was our first mind thief and it just sort of became this thing that every vermling their name starts with sq i don't know again intentional or not it's just sort of become a thing so when i created my trap character i named it squack bar um and every time i lay down a trap i would play that audio clip nice. of <laughs> admiral akbar say it's a trap 
It's a trap. Uh, and I would just, I would do it. And when I would play a card that would lay three traps, I would play it three times in a row. I would play it every single time. You actually playing the, 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 the yeah, I, had, sound bite. I pulled like a little sound bite on my phone that I would hit I every that. single time. Yeah. <laughs> the best. That's dedicated. What are you doing? What are you doing this turn, Dan? It's a trap. <laughs> it's a trap. It's a trap. Yeah, it's pretty much. Yeah. Um, so, and I just recently retired, uh, the last session I, right at the beginning, I retired. Uh, Admiral Squackbar and started up a Shuckles that I named Jake Marley um, in honor of Jacob Marley from the Muppets, uh, the pain with the chains. So, oh, uh, so I've, I've, I've had a couple of couple of scenarios with the with the Shackles and uh, it's been also a lot of fun. It's um, it's really interesting because that's three very different characters, right? like drastically different how they play and none of them are really conventional. Like it's not like you've had a, you know, a straightforward tank th thing with like some weird rules um, or just like, you know, even the death Walker essentially is a DPS thing that, that poops shadows. Right. But it's not a, it's not drastically different to how the game plays, but the Geminate very different. The trap, massively different to how it plays and then the shackles is a again like such a weird one to get a hold of because um uh none of what you know really matters like i remember watching daddy not really understanding it but going like yeah i suppose your health is supposed to yo-yo right and you're supposed to have all the status effects like that's not a thing so it's mm, fascinating mm. that that's been your three experiences yeah there's no way to prepare for those classes, right? Like there's there's not a lot of experience that you can draw on when you start up a shackles to go, oh yeah, I, I played a character kind of like this in another game. I kind of know how this works. It's like I get the basic idea. Um and and it's worked really well for me. So like I uh, when like I had mentioned with Talisman, I was always the thief. I love to play thieves. Um like D and D I am uh chaotic neutral. Like that's that's how I like to play. I steal everything. When I when I played Skyrim I was a thief stealing everything, right? Eventually became a stealth archer because everybody becomes a stealth archer eventually, but I at least started as pure thief. Um, but when we did Frost David, I really wanted to try and just kind of go somewhere different. And one of the things that I really enjoy, and, and this was something I definitely wanted to talk to you guys about, and I want to kind of pick your brains a little bit on this, is how people approach sort of their characters and building their characters. So one of the things that that I really enjoy is being reactive and being able to modify sort of on the fly how mm. I'm going to approach the battlefield and what's going to happen. So I think what I've seen online with a lot of characters, that, you know, in, in the communities, Amdurt, but also in Frosthaven Outpost, someone will say, hey, I'm about to start playing this character. Does anyone have a character guide or what items do you recommend? Like, what are the build paths that you can do? Because they want to sort of create the character and they want to have a uh, they want to have a plan of how they're going to do this. Um, versus I really like to just go, I don't know, let's find out what this thing does and let's just go mm -hmm. along and discover it as I'm playing. Like, is that something that... Uh, because one of the things that I've appreciated in the way that you've approached it is you do the unboxing and you sort of do like a first a first impression of it, but you aren't necessarily doing like character build guides in the traditional sense. Does does anyone in your group per, prefer to approach it in that way of sort of like planning out and mapping out your characters? Do you kind of just evolve it as it happens? Like how does that work for for your group? Yeah, the moment, like since the beginning, we've always had it that when we level up, we then reveal the cards, which you know, it's like it's all about crumbs, gi giving us those crumbs uh, all the way throughout the campaign. Which is why when we did our unboxing of the Banner Spear, like a year into the thing, it was kind of like really fresh and exciting for us. So we're, we're we're giving ourselves future excitement by doing this, and it's the same thing with picking cards. So I don't I don't think, but also there's no hard rule. Like I'm not going to sit here and tell like Mark and Phil, you're not allowed to look at your cards ahead and you're not allowed to make those plans, etc. I know guys and I tend to unlock things as we go. So at the end of a session, we get a new card. We then pass the cards around and we go, oh my God, look at this. And it's like hexes for days and, you know, and we get excited over that. So yeah, no, it's, it's very much a pull levers and we have a rough idea of kind of seeing the cards and how we want to get the most out of it and how we want to play it. But the rest of it's kind of just, yeah, pulled out of our ass. 
I think that's one of the things that is tricky with how some of the characters are designed is that they might lead through the first two or three levels with a path and then you expect that path to continue and then you get level four or five cards like there's a gap and you'd be like oh neither of these cards really do more of what I wanted it to do um and that's where I get stuck a little bit because I'm like oh maybe maybe I've chosen wrong. Like maybe the thing I thought was a path isn't a path now. And then you kind of get this weird like, uh, maybe I'll go back for another card and and that can be tricky. So it, it, it has its, it definitely has its pros from a discovery perspective and a figure it out like MacGyver kind of what, what pieces have I got? What decisions am I going to make? Um, but I think there's been some times where it is a little bit like, oh, I hope this isn't going to lead me down a path that's just not fun. Yeah. And I think, and I think to a certain extent, that approach is why. So it's funny. I know Geminit is not one of the most popular characters, uh, but I really enjoyed the the character. And I think a big reason for that is because I didn't have, I don't play with a build in mind. And I think many of the other characters have very specific builds. Like Drifter has the melee build where crushing weight is your main thing and you're going to do that there is a ranged build that you can do with the rate with the drifter a bullshit? A bullshit? but there are specific cards that you're going to pick and when you do that there's sort of specific turns that you want to set up right you kind of know your pattern of how you're going to play and what you're going to do the scenario rules may change you slightly but for all intents and purposes you're essentially playing the same way every scenario Whereas mm. I think the strength of the Geminit doesn't lie. There is no true build that I've seen. I think the strength in the Geminit is that you are so flexible and adaptable in any scenario that I would always be more focused on what is the scenario trying to do? What does our party need? And I can adapt on the fly as the Geminit to address the needs of the group. With that 14 card hand size when we would have a scenario that was survive 10 rounds i'd be burning cards left and right because i could get hyper aggressive and do whatever i needed to do in that case when we had a scenario where i know you all don't set the map up but we set the full map up so i could see this is a long scenario i could be a lot more conservative with my cards knowing hey if the rest of my party has a little bit trouble towards the end i'm still going to have stamina to be able to make it a little bit longer and because I had that in mind, I think it allowed me to connect in with the Geminit, I think, in a little different way than people who are kind of expecting that. Yes, but what's the build here? Like, when I am approaching mm. this build, what's the card I'm supposed to take at level two that helps me with that? I mean, I took Locust Host, which is that one that has that giant bar of red um, ranged attack. And everyone says that's the wrong card to take at level two. You take the other card. The other card's better. Well... If all you're doing is being reactive and flexible to the scenario, it's not the wrong card. N neither card is the right or wrong card. I would, I changed my cards out every scenario. I never mm. had a set hand with the Geminet. I would take five minutes for every scenario and completely rebuild my hand based on the party, based on the scenario that we were in. And I think for many players, that's not the way that they want to play. And that's okay, right? Like that's that It's a different style. But I think if you're thinking about a character and playing in that way, that's where a character like the Geminet becomes difficult or not as satisfying, I guess, is a better way of saying it. That That is such a, a cool perspective over the Geminet that, I mean, I 100% agree with everything you're saying. And I think we align very similarly with our thought process around, you know, this is the card that, you know, the internet may say is the go-to. And if you pick the other one, like with a range of the classes, uh, I think it's such a fresh um realistic take on it that allows you to yeah have control and agency over your own decisions and and all of that i'm wondering whether or not a lot of what you're explaining is a generational thing for just younger gamers in general who are being brought up with the internet as opposed to you know having it later on where they're just used to having all that information um immediately available and therefore you know you could load up any I, I play a lot of video games and i don't want to jump on too much of a tangent but i play a lot of video games and when I play a new game and I'm like, wow, this is really, really cool. I wonder what the community is like and all that. I go into it. And most of the posts are, how do I build this character? What do I do with this? How do I, it's, it's every game, every game that exists. Yeah. And 
it's uh, just, yeah, it's just, it's really cool to actually see more about what does this button do? What does this lever do? How does this, oh, okay, cool. Um, let's lean a little bit more into that weird thing that didn't work properly. But yeah, it's, it's self, you know, it's discovery and, and, and all of that, which I think is just play your own fun, obviously. But yeah, yeah I just think it's a great way to enjoy. It is, um, yeah. it is weird with uh, just on that point, um, that the more options that they put into games and more customization, the harder the communities hyper focus in on the best. So like if you go back and where you had less options in games, right? Less customization. It was more just like, hey, you you move forward and you can pick between A and B and that's it, right? Then I mean maybe the internet changed this, but then now you've got you can pick A or B or C D E F. And then once you pick one of them, you've got equal amount of other opportunities. But there will be a path and people are more interested. It's like they have more options and now they care less. They're like, no, no, no. I don't want to, I don't want to make decisions. I just want to know the best thing. It's a uh, yeah, it's an interesting situation we found this. ourselves in. I love this topic. So it's the idea of uh to me at its core, it's this idea of uh, the more limited your palette is, the more creative you have to be to create a good thing, right? And games, uh, particularly video games, have gotten so good. And the ability to design and build things with within the world of video games, like, it's, it's crazy. I mean, eight-year-old me would not believe what they have done with video games. But because the world is so open with what you can do, you lose, I think you lose, for me at least, you lose a little bit of that sense of being put into a box and needing to figure out how to be creative within the confines of that box. Um, I think for me, it's part of the reason why I still, to this day, am still essentially living in the 8 and 16-bit era. I mean, most of the games, the video games that I still play are old Nintendo and Super Nintendo games. And even in the other modern games that I play, I'm more drawn to games that are designed in that style um you know i loved octopath traveler which is oh a, yeah you're right it's a throwback to that era um because it's it's limited and i've tried to get into octopath traveler too but i'll be honest it expanded for for the way that i prefer games it expanded almost a little too much for me i'm not as drawn into octopath traveler 2 as i was the original because it almost got too big right mm. um now granted i was you know like final fantasy 6 for us, Final Fantasy III. That's my favorite game of all time. I was the perfect age when it came out. I was like 14 years old when that came out. If I tried to play that now for the first time, it's too much for me, right? Like mm. in, in, in my 40s, that's I, I don't have the capacity to, <laughs> to figure that out. So, But I still love Final Fantasy IV because it is limited, right? Like you don't have to make these choices about, well, which party member am I going to bring on this and which one aren't I? And how am I going to build this character yeah, and do yeah. all that? Some of that is done for you. So now you get creative with the weapons that you choose for that character. So by limiting that scope, it allows you more creativity within a smaller area. And for me, that's the sweet spot of it. Yeah. But just to clarify, when you talk about Final Fantasy 3 slash 6. Are you talking about with like Terra, Loki, Edgar? Yeah. 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 Oh, oh my God. Like, yes, 100% also favorite Final Fantasy yeah. game. It, yeah. It's probably hard to see because it's a little dark, but that right up there is uh, a painting I got that's of the mechs walking into Narsh right at the beginning. Oh. Of the very opening thing. So, yeah. yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I'll have to get you to show me that later. I'll take, send a photo. Yeah. But anyway, sorry. Yeah. So, just kind of weird, um, like, I don't know, fanboy uh, moment yeah. there. Yeah, nice. <laughs> no, that's cool. Uh, I'll, I will just move us along to, um, mm -hmm. oh, actually before I do, cause we're still on the characters kind of thing, characters that you've seen that, you know, exist in the game. Is there one that you have the least amount of interest in playing? You know, um, I, God, that's a good question. The well, cause so far you seem to love everything and I feel like you could turn, yeah. you could turn a turd into fun. So yeah, I mean, and, and because we don't have that idea of you there's because our group is very much not about playing most effectively i know that's a weird way to say it but like uh and this i don't i don't want to jump the gun on this but this is a topic i want to get into at some point which is like why do you play this game and why is it fun like because fun is different for different people what mm. is fun is different for different people so for us what's fun is doing weird stuff and not 
focusing on we're, we play the game at normal difficulty. We we don't we haven't done a plus one or anything like that yet, and that's because we want that freedom to make inefficient choices and and the wrong choice. Because if this works, it's going to be pretty cool, and it's going to create a great story, and it yeah. gives us that ability to do stuff that is the wrong choice. But for us, it's a lot more fun to play around with. Um, hmm. So because of that, every character that I've seen, I've seen things where I'm like, ooh, it would be fun to try to do that in a weird way. And and maybe the Drifter, just because I think because of the persistent effects it does for me, it sort of almost forces you to play in a specific way because of those persistent effects. So that might be the only character that I'm not overly excited to play, but every other character I just see endless possibilities in. Oh, I like that. Very fresh. Uh, very fresh take on it. Do you want to jump into your fun thing? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, sure. Just in and case I, I forget it and don't run into, t- I don't have time for it because yeah. I'm I'm interested in hearing it. And I think we can talk about this along with like memorable scenarios and things like yeah. that. So yeah, easily. So the question that I always think is is you know I think you had asked this before, uh, Daddy. I think you asked Gaz in a in a podcast was like, why do we play this game? Like, mm. what? why do we play Frosthaven? Why are we drawn to it? And, like, the easy answer is because it's fun, right? But but what is fun to one person and what's fun to a different person? Um, you know, I have great respect for people who play chess. Um, I have great respect for people, and I see the skill involved in something like poker or blackjack. I don't particularly enjoy those games because for my brain, at a certain point, they become math equations or Mm. they become, you should do this. This is the optimum play. And if you do not do this, you're doing it wrong and you are going to lose. Um, I do like randomness in a game, but I also like the freedom to try and do things different ways. So for us, we're never on our group, we're not trying to figure out what's the most powerful combo I can do with my cards. I can set up a three-turn combo where I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that every time because I've discovered that three-turn combination path will do more damage than this other three-card combination path that has less odds of doing damage. So I'm never going to do that other thing. We'll yeah. discover that and we'll go, I want to try this this time because I just want to kind of see how it goes. And, and I don't know, maybe the Monsters will do something weird, and I'll be able to do this random thing. And um, I'm going to toss a dead raven onto the attack as well. Um, my group loves the dead raven. Um, you know, just to try something different. And it, for us, creating those moments, it's really what the game is about. Um, I, I think maybe once or twice we tried to go up to a plus one, and we just discovered the game then when you increase that difficulty, the game sort of guides you towards playing it efficiently and figuring Mm. out what the best combos are. And for some people, that scratches the itch they have in a way that is very satisfying. So I understand why people go that way. If that's the itch you have, go that way and play that way and read the guides and figure out what the right way to build your deck is. It's just not the way that we like to play. So we engage with the scenarios on their merit. Um, one of my favorite scenario chains is the Pinter storyline with uh, you know blowing up the the shortcut through the past. Yep. Every I think you guys had talked about this. I think I when I tried to look it up online, everybody talks about yeah trying to mess with the 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 bombs was annoying and not worth the effort so we just attacked it and just did it that way we just kind of ignored the scenario mechanic we absolutely went all in on the scenario mechanic and tried tossing bombs every time we could because that for us was the fun thing yeah. um one uh, the other scenario chain that i really loved and i was glad you guys did it was the um 96 through 98 which was the very first scenario you had to like ride this sort of moving platform and you could ram into enemies. And then the middle scenario was the monster, the robot boss, that um, there were the pressure plates and you could steal the cards of the enemies and use those. Uh, and then, then there was the get out. I don't remember any of this. <laughs> I feel like you guys <laughs> talked about... So which one? Not, it, 
I feel 98? like you guys talked about 96, 97, and 98. I thought you guys had talked about that. Um, Did we apologies, go in- I'm spoiling something for you. No, 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 no not at all. Is this another I, I, I think we've done them. Is this a side It was a job. Um, it was a side scenario chain for, for a job. Yeah. I want to do that one, guys. Yeah, it sounds good. Let's do it. Put it on the list. Um, that sounds awesome. But there's but, this yeah. mechanic where you can essentially steal cards from the monsters and then have the monsters attack. And the main boss is, uh, if you attack the main boss, you only do half damage. If you can get a monster to attack the boss, it does full damage. Everywhere you look about that scenario, everybody says, the the mechanic sucked, we didn't do it, we just attacked the boss and we were able to brute force our way through it. Yeah. We went all in on the mechanic, and maybe it wasn't the most efficient way, but it created very a very memorable experience for us. So that's why I'm always curious when people, you know, what's your fun? Yeah. If it is being efficient and mastering the game and being able to say, I did 20 damage with this character on one turn. That's great. Um, Our fun is doing silly things and creating lore within the world. Our original bone shaper just decided they had a crush on the mayor, Satha. So every time we had... Uh, a choice to make on an event car or, you know, an outpost or a road event or anything, mm. the, our player just decided, what would impress the mayor? Because that's that's all that drives my character on how to do, right? Like, those are the kind of choices that we make that that really make the game fun for us. So, like, for your group, what's the fun? Like, what makes it fun for you? Um, I think... Uh, I don't know. I mean, for me, the thing that appeals to me from Gloomhaven, Frosthaven is uh, the puzzle solving aspect of like, you have a whole bunch of tools. Every turn is different. The pieces move. Uh, It is like a game of chess. Not that I play a lot of chess, but like it is a game of chess, but with like so many different variables. Right. Um, And every turn it's like, uh, how do you, how do you optimize what you've got? how do you make the best out of a shit situation um, and stuff like that? I think that's one aspect of it that I really like. Um, I think I do. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Go. Sorry. No, no, no. I, was say, I do. I do like those scenarios that, that, that we have experienced. I'm not going to spoil full mechanics, but they actually change the fundamental kind of rules of everything. Like, you know, the things that work in reverse, I'm using really mm-hmm. loose, vague things and, and, you know, hand limits and, and making really tough choices like that, which then throw you into a world of, well, I can't do the things that I would normally do. Um, so Gaz put it as MacGyver. We call it MacGyvering, which is obviously like, you know, cool, you're stuck in a cave and you've got a matchstick and you've got, you know, a blade of grass and you've got uh, um, uh, the Beatles album, right? Yeah. So use those tools to get out. I love that idea in games. It's kind of like, you know, you can't use traditionally what you've seen as the op- op- the optimal best way of clearing something you have to come up with a solution to to a problem and you know it's something that we can take into many different games not just in Frosthaven. it's just yeah it's just part of that the mental puzzle that i definitely enjoy and i think you know we all sort of enjoy that there, there's a game that um one of my favorite games and it's it's definitely on the fun thing that has been panned by so many critics and I don't know if you know of the game, or I don't know if you've played the game, but it's called Nemesis. And Nemesis is basically by Awakened Realms. It's a space game, right? Big ship. And the general idea is that you're a survivor on the ship. It's semi-cooperative. And you're, you know, you've got, you, you wake up, your character's got amnesia. They all wake up in a hibernatorium. And then all the, all the tiles of the spaceship are face down. So you don't know where you are because you've got an amnesia. And you've got to work together to complete personal objectives um, that no one else knows. And some of them are hostile, like you need to make sure a certain player in the team doesn't make it out of alive. And you've got another one that, you know, make sure that the actual ship, because there's different modules in the ship to organize where it's going to go and if the engines are working properly and, and which escape pod, all that kind of stuff. The game is chaos. And it's literally right from the very get go, you've got your personal quest and it's like, hey guys, I'm going to go this way. Do you want to come with me? And there's, like, you're making noise and aliens eventually start, you know, breaking into the ship and, and, and all of that. A lot of people don't like the game because they say it's a random mess with a lot of, you know, there's dice rolling, uh, you use dice to, for, for combat and all of that. And that's why, you know, there's no agency, there's no decision making. It's just run around and do sorts of stuff. I absolutely love this game. 
for the main reason of, uh, I'm going to go this way and see what happens. Oh, crap, this is happening. Gaz, come help. Oh, Gaz is dying. Uh, I'm going to lock him in a room next to me and run away. Gaz, good luck. <laughs> Best of luck, everything. Um, next minute, Gaz is de dead. It's got player elimination, you know, things like that. It, the, the stories and memories it creates is where the fun is at. And a lot of people look at the game like, there's no strategy involved. There's no this involved. You know, it's a it's a random hot mess. And yet it appears on, like, not from a critical point of view, but from a user point of view, if we're going to go with Metacritic, that kind of idea, people, just your ordinary gamers, love the game. Right? Because Absolutely love it. Because you can't master it. Right? Like, that's the difference. That's the, Some people want a game they can master, that they can feel that Get good sense at. of, I am good at this, and be, I have figured out how to be good at this. And if I win, it's because I have done the work and I figured out how to master this game. And if I lose, it's because I need to get better. I need to find something. And some people don't like that feeling of, if I lose it, and there was nothing I could have done about it, how is that fair? It's not fair if I lose and there was nothing I could have done to change that effect, right? Like some people feel that way. I'm with you, Denny. And I love that element of randomness to it because that's to me that's fun right like the unknown mm. and that and that sort of sense of discovery of like i may do the thing that appears to be the thing that would be the smart thing to do and it could completely blow up in my face um and and i i really enjoy that i think um i think to play devil's advocate slightly and it's not really actually because it's agreeing with what you're saying but there is a as a tipping point which that randomness and lack of ability to not just not so much plan but um kind of have influence over your actions to the outcome becomes uh like playing uno right like it doesn't matter because there's so many other random things happening that you really can't control the outcome so you may as well just pick it random um i think the thing that appeals to me for gloomhaven or frosthaven i think we talked about this in maybe the first or second episode so understandably if people haven't heard those because they were terrible uh but the the decision and the responsibility that you have at, at round 10, at round 15 of a scenario, when you go, oh, RNG kicked our ass here, we lost because of that. But really, you had five to 10 turns earlier that probably set it up, like the card you played, the order you, you played, like where you stood, what you did, all of those things will matter. So it's um, it means that like it's a whole bunch of decisions you make that lead to a decision, but you can't see that path, which is really cool because uh, I think for exactly what you guys are talking about there, um, you kind of just have to fly by the seat of your pants sometimes. Like you can make good decisions, but there's no guarantee that they're going to end up with good outcomes in five, five turns. Right. Um, but on the flip side, when you play really high difficulty, that's kind of required. So it's a weird balance. And we were, we were talking about this. I don't know if we talked about it on the pod or if we were just talking about it after the scenario, but like the higher difficulty really does make you have to play super optimally and you can get wrecked by bad RNG. So uh, even more so you can go, well, I did the right thing, but the game said no. Um, mm. And that's almost a failing because you, you are, you're like, I've optimized as much as I can to do the right thing here. And yet I still can't get across the line. And it's because like, you know, we had 10 curses in the deck and they had 15 cards and they still didn't draw them. Right. Like that's just bad RNG. Um, and they hit me for eight or crit me or whatever. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. Cause I think you can get out of Gloomhaven, Frosthaven, exactly what you guys are talking about. And that's what sounds like your group, the way your group is playing it. Like very much like that nemesis, very much like that, you know what, we're going to go mm -hmm. in and we're going to do the things we want. And it doesn't really matter because we're probably going to get there in the end. We're going to figure it out as we go, but we're going to embrace the imperfections, right? Versus you can actually shift the rules within the rules, right? Without house rules of variance, but you can actually shift it to make it also appealing for the people who go, you know what, I want to master this character and this class and like do that. So it's kind of amazing that they've managed to fit both of those elements in. The challenging part is that community all live together. So I think like people don't understand what people want. Like they're like, oh, hey, yeah. I was looking, with, looking at this class and people are like, oh, you have to choose this, right? Like you were talking about with the Geminate. Are you, no, right. no, that's the wrong decision. And it's like, uh, yeah, you probably got to understand what someone wants before you tell them that they're wrong. Mm. And, and and the like what you're talking about, guys, with the rules and the way that you can do it. Like if if you're really going for that sort of mastery, I would imagine the reduced randomness variant of 
changing the crit into a plus two and the null into a minus two would almost you would almost have to do that otherwise like you said a, a crit or a, a null at an inopportune time makes you feel like well i did everything right and i just had really bad luck and that feels bad but i also think that they've done again whether it's intentional or maybe it was just pure luck on it but the fact that you get more gold at higher levels is allowing you when you play at a more at a higher difficulty you can upgrade your character faster you can enhance your cards faster you can buy more more items uh so it almost becomes this um very positive feedback loop if you play well at a high level you're going to get even stronger which is going to allow you to play better mm -hmm. at a higher level which is going to get you stronger faster whereas if you keep it at that lower level you're not going to be able to upgrade your character as fast which means that sort of randomness is going to play a higher role in your game, which is probably going to keep you from wanting to level up yeah. the difficulty. Yeah, and I think our group kind of evolved from, you know, majority of the campaign we've done at plus zero, which has been like much like, you know, your group has been. Uh, and then it's probably the last 10 weeks or so. We've just, I think we just found that there was a run of like scenarios were just too easy. Like they were like really cool mechanically, but we never got a chance to explore the mechanics because it, nothing had enough life. And uh, it wasn't, I think that we were playing super optimally, but we just had some combinations in the party that were just, people had worked out, right? And it's like, well, I'm not gonna choose to play suboptimally on purpose because I want things to go longer. So it's like play cards, do things, scenario was done and we didn't really get to in, embrace that. So the last few weeks of playing at a higher difficulty is actually, I guess for me, going back to your original question of like, where's the fun? The fun for me now after playing this game for a year and a half is like looking at the challenge of, okay, everything hits really hard and has heaps of hit points uh, and is immune to everything. Uh, okay, how do I deal with that? Like, but that's- It's become a lot more about working together. That's and what, that communication. Yeah, it's like, oh god, there's so much stuff here. I'm gonna, I'm about to take 13 damage, etc. And Gaz is like, okay, I can disarm that one. And I'm like, oh my god, that's amazing. Okay, you, you can, and it's working out. Yeah, I guess tactically and and uh, reactionary to to the current situation we're in. How best as a group we can without the need to, hey, I need you to do something, or I need, you know, and there's no quarterbacking or anything like yeah. that. Yeah, the just... fun's evolved. The fun evolved mm. for you, right? Like because yeah. one of the things that you had talked about is a big piece of the game that was fun for you was the sense of discovery, right? Well, you've unlocked every character. You, mm. You're getting fairly close to the end game. The discovery of the game is starting to minimize. So that can't if if you were still relying on discovery to be a significant part of your enjoyment of the game, the game's gonna get less fun. So you shifted the way that you played the game to sort of add a different level a different layer to it that now is that has become your fun because what was originally a big part of your fun is no longer available to you so yeah that makes sense that you would shift that kind of through the campaign yeah that's a really good point actually and uh I, you know just because how daddy was explaining it i feel like the scenarios are now looking feeling a little bit more like spirit island if you've played that um mm -hmm. just that idea where you flip the cards over and go like oh can anyone deal with that guy because i can't deal with that guy like he's that that guy's yeah. doing something that's really bad and we need to stop that and so it kind of is again calling on everyone to be like uh collectively these are the threats what does everybody have that can do a thing versus like okay everyone play your own game and just look at how you can do cool stuff um, and it's, it's been interesting to see that shift because we've also had to change our mindset a little bit around it as well. Um, because now even doing cool stuff doesn't kill stuff. Like you're like, Oh, I just had a great turn. Oh, the thing's still alive and it hits me for eight. Oh shit. Okay. <laughs> um, maybe that's not a thing anymore. <laughs> so yeah, it's been good. Just, just, just quickly on, uh, um, on Spirit Island. I'm not going into Spirit Island. Uh, you said you've played Spirit Island. Mm -hmm. Have you played it with Branch and Claw? No. Right. There's um, Spirit Island. Obviously, is a very, um, very, very low luck. Right. It's very, mm -hmm. very low luck. It's all about you know, cooperatively working together to you know rid an island of um, the invaders. And Branch and Claw. I love that game. I couldn't play it infinitely, right? Mm -hmm. Just because of how deterministic a lot of it is, and it's testing. You know, you can see how this goes and that goes, but very quickly you can be overwhelmed and you can lose. What I love about that game now is Branch and Claw uh, brought in an event deck 
and this is going to be a thing that you can either use or you don't want to use. But it's in a deck that, you know, during a certain phase of the game, you reveal one card and it says this happened, this happened, um, these these things die, this area clears off the invaders, but these all of these Dahan die. And it changes the board state in a random way because it's a deck of cards. It's an event deck. And that has changed the game for me completely mm-hmm. because that's the RNG that I need. I need the randomness and chaos in my games. And I think, Dan, you're very similar to me in that we reactionary from a, okay, cool, what's the challenge that's going to throw at us now? We flip it over. Oh, no, that area I thought was safe is now no longer safe. Crap. How do we deal with that? Yeah. And yeah, so it was just more of that, that fun thing that has made the game even way more fun for me, whereas it will definitely do the opposite for other people who prefer being a bit more in control over having, you know, it's almost like tactics versus strategy and you have an overall strategy, whereas I never have a strategy, but I (laughs) tactically will work with what is happening as the game's evolving or whatever I'm playing. And I enjoy that a lot more because I can't think two rounds ahead. I have to think now. (laughs) Yeah. But there has to be a certain level. I mean, with the randomness. So I was famous in our group in Talisman because of the rolling of the die. We actually tracked this for a while. When you get to the crown of command, especially if you're playing with the old original, you roll a six-sided die, or five or six, everybody loses a life, one, two, three, everybody's safe. We tracked it for a period of time, and I want to say that my two friends, David and Darren, were generally hitting at about 60% on that. They'd roll a four, five, or six about 60% of the time. I was somewhere down around 31%. Kidding. I, I'm famous for not being able to roll a four, five, or six, and I lost games, multiple games that I had gotten yep. to the crown of command because I couldn't kill people because I couldn't roll a four, five, or six. So it was supposed to be a 50 50 shot. Um, and that was frustrating. So that, that was a little too much randomness for me. <laughs> you just need to practice and get better at rolling yeah. in that situation. Oh, like, if anything, it's teaching you. You're not good at it. Get better at it. Go I look mean, at a guide on how to roll it better. If you want to know particular. why I listen to this podcast is because I already have a PhD in rolling terribly. So <laughs> I <I'm... laughs> And that's, um, yeah, it's funny because I think that's one of the th- reasons why I like playing games with a uh, amount of randomness in person. Um, I, I think I might have mentioned this before, but... Uh, you know, if you're playing a game and you have to roll 5d6, right, and you got to roll good numbers or whatever it is, it doesn't matter, you're in person and you roll, and if you roll all sixes or you roll all ones, which is ridiculously low happening, but you're there with people, everyone gets to go like, whoa, even in, like, I've played tabletop miniature games where someone just rolled absolute fire, and you look and go, that's ridiculous, but oh my god, I was here to witness it, I'm mm-hmm. about to get deleted, but okay, cool. If that happens online you kind of feel really like, ugh, I feel like I got ripped off there. Like, if it's AI-generated randomness, and I don't know why this is, even if it's with a player, like, you click the button to roll the dice, but it's AI, I'm like, nah, I feel I feel that, I feel <laughs> there's something wrong with that. And that's where, uh, you know, a big part of this podcast kind of comes from in that, you know, it's master's degree and rolling terribly, but we really do roll with the luck kind of element of, like, positive and negative and I think if you're going to say, oh, I love randomness, you have to be okay with bad random. Like, you can't be like, oh, I love randomness, but only if I roll really good. Because that's not randomness, yeah. right? That's like, I, I want good numbers all the time. And that's something I think some people struggle with. They go like, oh, I've got the worst luck. And like, yeah, but you probably just remember all the bad ones. You're forgetting all the good ones. But either way, you just got to kind of roll with it. I mean, some of the most memorable moments are the ones where you have something purpose- perfectly set up. And the only way I've got, I've got two blesses in my deck. And because of the way I've been setting up my AMD, I've got 25 total cards in my AMD. And the only way this doesn't work is the miss. And you pull that miss. Oh. And that is, that is heartbreaking, but it's also so memorable. And like yeah, when I think moment. back on those moments that I remember, like from Gloomhaven campaigns, those are the, mem- the memories I have the most. And they were fun. They were fun. I mean, Unless it's literally a situation where it's like, we spent five hours on this, and if we miss here and now, we're going to get delayed, and we're really frustrated that we didn't be able to complete this thing because we're not going to get together for again for three months. I mean, in that case, just, you know, it was a minus two I pulled, actually, you know, like, one's, Isaac's not going to helicopter his way to, to your house for that one, but <laughs> those are the moments that you remember, right? And, and yeah. it, it's 
going back to a kid playing video games, it's you try to do something. And, Mom, the computer is cheating. That's why I can't beat it. I mean, it's, you know, it's the same yeah. thing when you hear something about clicking that button that the computer's cheating, not in person dropping oh, the dice. Time. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting as well because I feel like even though we've had some really, really bad luck kind of misses and not just like, oh, I was trying to do a really cool thing and now I don't get to do it, but like kind of key pivotal points. But I still don't think we've had a scenario we've lost because someone pulled a null, right? Like even in the grand scheme of things, all that does is go like, Ooh, okay, this is gonna be hard. Like that was a that I was we were kind of relying on that one to clear that monster. Um now we don't have that. So how do we pull together and make this still work, right? Um and I mean we've had ones that have come down to the last card flip where that could be a miss and we could lose, but you know, we haven't, and so it kind of but means the tension was there. Yeah, like the actual exactly. the sweating, the breathing, everything. We're all sitting there just staring at that card, yeah. waiting for it to be flipped over. And I think that's where the um that's where changing the the crit and the miss to a minus two and plus two, I think robs that slightly because there are times where you're like, oh, I'm doing an attack six. I only need to do like two damage to this. So literally the only card that stops this is the miss. Mm -hmm. A minus two doesn't stop it. Like, again, that's where you start getting to the deterministic kind of piece of like, well, it doesn't matter. Like this can't, this can't miss, this can't lose. I'm going at, I'm going, I'm playing a, a 10 initiative card and i've got boots of speed so i can't not go first right like so you get all these situations where you can kind of start mapping it out and that's mm -hmm. i think in games once that happens and you can look at the next turn or two and say oh we're fine that's when that as you know especially if it's been a high tension scenario that's where that kind of drops right off and it's really disappointing because it becomes just a admin to get through the motions of it mm -hmm. yeah amazing um uh, very quickly, do you play with any house rules? So we adopted okay. your house rule of the battle goals, but we just recently instituted a very minor adjustment to it, which is from now on, because we all we all just very recently started new characters, with the exception of our coral, who's been a coral for a long time and will probably actually retire next time we get together. Um, they might even be retired by the time they hear this episode, which is when you complete a battle goal, you keep it in your hand and then when you retire all the battle goals you completed go back into the available deck that's cool i like it so yeah. very similar to yours but just individual people um with it we did change bastion to a, a, a two checker um <laughs> and we actually had our coral complete bastion before we did that wow cool cool well yeah. just for the record as well i don't think that's our house rule i think we stole it from someone else so we're, oh, happy, we're, 100%, we're happy to claim uh influence from it but uh, i love that I it was um, modified it a little the, bit as well the house rule episode where i was reading them out to you guys uh, forever ago yeah. and i was like i actually don't mind that one yeah. it was kind of like yeah oh, we had yeah. all of them that was the one we kept we're, we're pretty we're pretty vanilla other than that the only other thing that i'm pretty sure that we've done was <clears throat> um our snowflake had the PQ where it was they would retire right after downtime. And so they would have to do the sort of victory lap. We yeah. would have we would have stuck with the victory lap, but we knew that I was gonna retire my trap after the next era. So we were gonna have two retirements at the same time. So we decided to let the snowflake kind of skip the line. Because we really like to let new characters kind of have one scenario by themselves as the new character to kind of get their shine. So we kind of fudged it a little bit there. But other than that, we tend to play it pretty much pretty much straight. I think Gaz has um, made that comment sometimes when we've got two people close to retirement of, well, we don't want to start with two freshies who yeah. are learning their character necessarily in the next one. So we kind of, similar to you, space it out a little bit, yeah. which which makes perfect sense. Have you tried playing scenarios wrong so they're just harder? Because that's what we do by accident. <laughs> but we don't find out till we release the episode and people tell us we got the rules wrong. We're like, oh, wow, it would have been way easier if we'd read the rules properly. <laughs> I mean, I think that's all just making up for the misinterpretation of the snow imps from the beginning, right? That's, so you're we're being spending, that you're basically time. spending the rest of your campaign yeah. trying to balance oh. the universal scales from that one. We kill four snow imps, like we double damage, <laughs> and suddenly we're punished for the like next hundred scenarios. Like, oh, I know, I know. So, plans now is that at the end of every M Dead chats, I generally because we're, we're creeping towards it. Mm -hmm. Um, I have usually something set up, which is usually a quiz, and it's usually against Gaz, and it's always super fun. 
uh, especially for me to come up with these all the time. It drives me absolutely nuts trying to go, well, how can I make this interesting? Um, and then, yeah, we'll, we'll close it up with any final thoughts and all of that, if that sounds good. Sounds great. So, uh, Gaz's Gauntlet, which is what we did last week, which you haven't heard yet because we haven't launched, uh, released that particular episode, uh, won't work this time because there's still so much of the game you have yet to see. So I've catered this towards, you know, what you have seen, uh, hopefully. Appreciate and, that. And, uh, w- we've called this Gaz Bangs with Dangs. So... We've got some fairly niche questions. I was going to let I'm my provide... child listen to this pod, but now I'm on the fence. <laughs> <laughs> have I sworn yet? I don't think I have. Not word for it. He... Do I have to put an explicit tag on this one? And usually, okay. He um, I'll well. provide... We're, we're, we're safe. Okay. Oh, okay, cool. I'll provide four answers. Okay. Getting the right answer uh, will award you with three points. If you get it wrong, your opponent gets a shot to answer. Only one. One shot. And if they get that right, they get one point. So we alternate back and forth between the two of you over eight questions. Um, you both get a single 50-50, which can be used to remove two wrong answers. And phone Biggest a friend at some point? Uh, no, I'm slowly <laughs> working towards doing a game show, if you couldn't tell. Uh, just trying things out and how they work. The other problem is I need to be mindful that you can't see on the screen like all the old possible a- a- answers and all of that. So uh, I can't keep it too complicated. So we'll start off with Dang. So your first question, scenario one, I assume you've done that. We did, a- yes. A town in flames. It involves saving Frosthaven from the first Algox attack. How many ally guards are in the scenario? Four, five, six, or seven? Now, for clarification purposes, we're talking about a four-player game, right? Does that change? I'm wondering if it changes. I don't know. Uh, uh, it's been a long actually, time. Actually, it's a really good point. I'm not 100% sure. Let's say it's a four-player game. Okay. Which I know, because you have done that. Mm-hmm. So we'll go with that. Okay. So four, five, or four, five, six, or seven guards... Four, sure. uh, four, five, six, or seven guards. I feel like there were five in the second room and one in the first. So I'm going to go with six. Going to go with six. I did just check the actual scenario based on player count. It does change the amount of guards. Mm. So thank you. Very good point. You went with six. That is incorrect. Gaz, you get one shot at this. Seven? Yeah. That is also incorrect. Oh. There are five. There is one in the first room and four, four in the following. Wow, I didn't expect that. I thought okay, there was cool. the five in the second room, but all right. Side note, well, I just want to point out, I think I think they should win an award for scenarios one, two, three, four. I think it's unassailable as an intro into the game, the way that it's built, the way it ramps you into the campaign. Um, yeah. With the exception of what I've heard didn't happen to us, but in either two or three, apparently you can lose on the first turn if the a certain character, uh, a certain enemy draws a certain card, they can get hits and kill the person you're supposed to keep alive, and there's no way to stop that outside have, of that. Have experienced. Have um, experienced. What's that? Which scenario is that? Scenario two. That's two, with two a certain three, yeah. ally. That we open a door. Oh, once you open the door. Okay, yeah, yeah. So not the first yeah. turn, but like once you so, open yeah. it, you can just draw badly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But outside of that, I think um, scenarios one through four are incredible. The way that it sets the world, sets the stage for your three branching main paths, pulls you into the the world. Uh, you know, this is not an original thought, but where it, somebody had mentioned, uh, I, think, I think it was on a review of the game, I can't remember, but... You're marching towards Frost David. You're tired. All you want is a warm fire. And then, boom, the town is on fire. Like, there's just so many little things in that. I think I, I think the, the opening salvo of the game, so to speak, is incredible. And it's one of the reasons that, I mean, we knew we'd like it, but it just hooks you in so well. It I think. sets the it, it scene. It's the incredible. Same. Yeah, 100%. It sets the scene. All right, guys, question two. Scenario... Seven, <laughs> which I know is already going to get questions from you. What's the first scenario in the Lurker quest chain? And Gaz, you might remember it. It was a little on the easy side. Forever luring us into a false sense of security on how <laughs> dangerous the Lurkers 
can be. What is the name of that scenario? Is it rim of reality, boundary of the earth, end of the horizon, or edge of the world? <laughs> uh, I'll say number four, edge of the world. That is correct. Nailed it. Well done. See? See? You may not know a lot, but I can still <laughs> work it out. I might not know a lot. Thanks for the drive-by <laughs> on that one. A little bit. Dang. Question three. Scenario 15. Decrepit elevator. Mm -hmm. You have done this, haven't you? We just did that. Oh, It fantastic. was my debut That's scenario. Fresh. Knuckles. It was, yes. Uh, scenario 15 sees the heroes descend a decrepit elevator whilst fighting off an army of unfettered. You pass ledges that introduce ancient artillery for you to destroy. On one of the platforms is a treasure tile. What is inside? Is it 10 XP? Is it three loot cards? Is it 15 coins? Or is it a blueprint? Okay. So that was my debut scenario with the shackles. And I played the card that allowed me to absorb bad status effects for any one of my allies within a range of three. And the robots kept drawing their muddle everything within a range two card. So I got muddled about 18 times and it was perfect. <laughs> it wow. was well played. <laughs> I think. Did you loot it? I did, not, it? I did not loot it, which was a which was a noteworthy because I am the group loot goblin. Um, I'm a thief, so it's a rogue uh, tray, right? Uh, yep. But unfortunately, uh, I did not loot this one. But I think we did, and I'm pretty sure it was a random blueprint. Blah, random blueprint. It was not. <laughs> Yes. So what are the other options? 15 gold, 10 XP, or 3 loot cards? Yes. Uh, I'm going to say 15 gold. No, it, it was not. It was 3 loot cards. Oh, okay. That was, that was like my <laughs> third answer. <laughs> oh, but, see, that makes sense because one, does that have a random item as part of the loot deck? Um, It does. Yes. That was one of the things that got looted as part of that was a random uh, item. That's funny. So you found a <laughs> random item in the in the chest that yes. has the cards. Yep. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm just making sense. excuses for why I'm on too. That's all. No, 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 no. It's fine. It's fine. I guess it was guess okay at some stage. I like um I've had to really go quite niche with these, so that's why I offered multiple choice. Mm. Guys, in scenario two, which we were literally just talking about. After clearing the first room, you are met with an Elgox priest who is pinned down from a rain of archer arrows. The priest taunts them, shouting, blank. <laughs> Frostbitten buffoons. Glacier gutted goons. Foul ice pisses. Frost fanged fools. Oh god, okay. Uh, let's Go 50-50 on this one. I want to try out this 50-50 call. Yeah. We have foul ice pisses and frost fanged fools. I'm going to go with frost fanged fools. Well, that is wrong. Really? <laughs> yes. Dag, would you like to have a guess? A frost pissers for the win. Final answer. That's right. <laughs> foul ice pisses. Wow. That was the first thing she said when we met her. Okay. Uh, Dag, question five. The back of character mats gives you an introduction to the character slash class and some backstory as well. It also provides a complexity rating, elemental affinities, and a graph displaying how good they can be at certain aspects of the game. These roles are melee, ranged, mobility, support, defense, and control. The Geminate, due to its flexible playstyle, has a fair bit of everything. According to this map, despite being viable, which role is it weakest at? Is it melee? Is it mobility? Is it control? Or is it support? 
I'm not going to go 50 50 because I've got two. And if you go, if I go 50 50, you're going to go down to the two I'm going through. I know how this game works. <laughs> um, going to go with support. That is right. It is support. Yeah. Thought it was that well, or control, uh, but I was pretty sure with the support because there's a decent, there's a little bit more of like immobilize and things like that that you can do than than the healing. yeah. When I, when I was looking at it, the, the all the bars are actually got a fair bit in them, which you know a lot of the other characters I've seen definitely have some that are just flat out nothing. Um, but no, it was it was cool to kind of see, and I was like, oh, that, that's pretty even. Um, you got some obviously much higher, but yeah, support was only like just below like two others, which I thought was pretty cool. Guys. You've just, just fallen one behind. All right. You got this. You got this. Uh, question six, staying on the same path. Gaz, we know you're one of the top three trap players in the oceanic region. According to the map, which role is the traps strongest? Is it control? Is it support? Is it mobility? Or is it ranged? Uh, control. It is control. Oh, was that too easy? Damn it. Because all of the other ones seemed, like, fairly the same. It's like, Control was only just edging out, like... Oh, really? I think so. I, have to, I can't remember. That's right. All right. All right. Well, you've just killed my buzz um, by, by taking over again. All right, Dang. Um, I'll PM you the answers to this one. So, question seven. This is your last one. Which of the following is not a battle goal? Kill two or fewer enemies. Zero cards in hand each rest. Kill an enemy with an attack that has disadvantage. Or have one or more cards in hand each time you rest. Kill two or fewer or uh, kill two or fewer enemies. Zero cards in hand each rest. Kill an enemy with an attack that has a disadvantage. Or have one or more cards in hand each time you rest. I, I haven't done the I gotta use my 50-50. We'll go with kill two or fewer enemies. Kill an enemy which has uh, with an attack that has disadvantage. Okay. I'm pretty sure it's the kill two or fewer enemies because I think there is a battle goal like that, but I think the number is different. The number of enemies you're, that you can kill is, I think, three or maybe one. I can't remember, but I don't think it's two. I'm going to go with that. Lock it in? Yes. That is right. And you're very right. It is three. Well done. Yeah. Finally, guys, further win. <laughs> Question eight. The Geminate has the ability to harm and apply negative conditions to a wide range of enemies and teammates. At level one, how many abilities? Either harm or put a negative condition on an ally. Is it, sorry, is it two? <laughs> <laughs> is it two, three, four, or five? Ooh, all right, I'm going to talk through this one. So I remember Go the wound it. one. Um, Because Phil, I wounded Phil and they didn't heal him. <laughs> um, I remember there's like a... I think there's a muddle one. Um, and I'm just trying to think if there's any other negative conditions because I don't think you you wouldn't apply immobilize or stun or disarm to anybody. Uh, I'm going to... What was was two one of the answers? I'm, I'm going to read the end of that thing. At level one, how many abilities either harm or put negative conditions on an ally? Oh, either harm. Okay. Oh, they've probably got some, like, move, do a thing, do one damage to everything. Um, so what are the options again? Two, three, four, five? Two, three, four, five. I'm going to go with three. Final answer? Yep. You are wrong. Oh, okay. All right. Let's see. All right. So I didn't do this. So I remember you always talking about this, and I don't think I ever played that wound card to wound allies. I think I brought oh, it. I love that card. It was his favorite. <laughs> I rarely brought it. I know I had the good initiative, but I rarely brought it. And I think the one time I did wound, I ended up not wounding any of my allies. <clears throat> but 
but I think you can poison within a range. And I think there's one other thing that I can't remember. So I'm going to go with four. Two seems like not enough. That is right. Yeah. It is four. And we've lost Gaz. Gaz's camera, he just decided to rage quit. Um, <laughs> uh, you got no sound at all. Do I have sound now? Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah, I thought I was just, I'm done. I've had enough of this. Um, <laughs> I forgot about poison. Like, of the course we would one, be yeah. poisoning everyone, right? Like, yeah, okay. So there's one there wound, point, one muddle, one wound poison, muddle. one damage? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Love it. Well done. Well done. Gaz's defeated streak uh, still holds, I think. Yep. But and to make sure I keep <laughs> losing, otherwise people won't come on the show. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was, it, yeah, you lost on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm not claiming that at all, but like, it, you know, I'm just like a punching bag, right? Like, come along and have a, have a whack. So, um, we will start to wrap it up there. Um, is there like anything you'd like to see more from us, Dang? Any advice for us? Anything, you know, a certain direction or anything like that? I think one of the things that's made listening to your podcast really enjoyable for me is I think you have a really nice balance between. <clears throat> As you unlock characters and do scenarios, there are things you have to talk about, or otherwise you just can't talk about the experience that you've had. But there are ways to talk about them without fully spoiling them. And I've been able to listen to your podcast, despite you being much further ahead in the game, without being fully spoiled. Part of that, um, I will fully admit, is the fact that uh, my brain doesn't work 100%. So you'll talk about a thing, and then I'll completely forget about it until I play it and experience it myself and then i'll go oh yeah they talked about this i had completely forgot about that so that actually is partly me but i also i think it's partly uh a testament to the way that you talk about those spoilers and you don't give you give necessary details but you don't give unnecessary details that would be extra spoilery i guess for lack of a better way of saying it uh so please whatever balance you're striking there please keep that because it's great um I don't know if it's obvious, but I also forget all of the scenarios we do straight <laughs> after we do them as well. So uh, I, I'm just I'm there with you. I'm the same wavelength, except for the road events. Those are those are your specialty. But 100%. Scenarios, yeah. um, yeah. But also, uh, I also highly recommend to anybody if you're like in a similar place with me. When one of the things that's been really fun is if when we play a scenario. I'll go back and re-listen to the pod where you talk about that scenario because now it really solidifies in my head and I it I can connect a little bit more with what you're saying, which is really fun. Um, no, I think it's been it's been really fun to listen to you. I, I love the amount of detail that you go into. Um, thank you for being open to the suggestion I had about recapping which characters, who was playing what character at what level. Um, Again, because I don't remember things, having that reminder was was really helpful. And uh, yeah, so as far as the pod is going, no, nah, it's 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 been awesome. Yeah, like no, suggestion like that, it's a really good because I was thinking about it a bit ago if we wanted to go back and have a listen to an episode earlier of like, oh, when we do that scenario, like if I wanted to recap on where we were, we didn't do that then and we probably have no record of it. So if we went back to scenario, or like, sorry, episode 15 and listened to that scenario for any reason, we probably wouldn't maybe have an idea about what level we were, what character we were playing. So it's kind of been good uh, to at least catalog that stuff now. We have a record. So I think it was a really, a really good suggestion. And just on that like because you provided that that feedback i mean we'll take all feedback on board and definitely you know find a way to incorporate it because if it, if it makes it easier for one person like you know it, it may be making it easier for a whole bunch of other people as well who you know having a a similar um you know experience with with that so feel free not just you dang but anyone else as well like get in touch with us and just say hey i wish a little bit more of this a little bit less of this and we can always see what we can do like i read everything that comes through Except um, for Ormi, so, we won't change our stance on Ormi, Mark. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I was going to say. Um, just on Ormi, exactly. Yeah. Can you give me a refresher on what happened? Yeah, poor Ormi. We were so excited about Ormi, and uh, we had painted. We didn't have a Deathwalker in the group, so we used it, the Deathwalker mini to be Ormi. Um, and we got it on scenario 109, the Furious Factory, and the that Furious was the Factories. one with the lasers. And Ormi just got and obliterated the first by the lasers. <laughs> it, I, I think we survived the first room, but I, as the Geminit, went to the right. I 
depending on where you're sitting, but I, I went to the right <laughs> and opened up a room and there's lasers in there and Ormy followed me in and just, <laughs> it was almost like he was running into the path of the lasers was the way that it, we just abandoned Ormy so quickly. There was no chance. Uh, poor guy. I had never stood a chance. <laughs> I love that. Absolutely love that. Ormy is like, it's one of those things that they've put into the game that everyone's going to experience differently and just create just an endless amount of stories. I love it. So such I'm, a simple concept. I'm so excited about the idea of Ormi somehow coming back because we have we don't Ormi's not coming back in our campaign. <laughs> <laughs> he's, apparently, he's not coming back in ours either. Like, no, hundred percent not. Um, thank you, Dang. Thank you very much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. You, you're you're a lot of fun to talk to. Thank um, you. you've got some really, really cool ideas and I like the fact that just, you know, a lot of what you say and what you have said has resonated quite strongly with me because I think that you and I, um, yeah, just, just on a very similar level, with just the thought process of how we play games and how we look at it and how we approach it and all of that. It's really refreshing to kind of hear, um, a lot of that from someone that, you know, is on the other side of the world, um, that we've met through this, but thanks so much for, yeah, coming on and sharing, you know, a bit about your life and your experiences and, and, um, you know. Your, your games and stories. Yeah, thanks for having me on. And thanks for co creating, I mean, not only the pod, but the community. I mean, it's been everybody. I mean, I really, really like the way that the rules of the community, the channel's literally called Be a Good Human. You know, I mean, it, it's it's that easy, right? But it's, yeah. it's so easy for the internet to not become that. And people forget that the internet is not a separate thing. It is real life. It, it is real people. It's It's not some separate thing. So everybody that has seemed to come into the community is a good human. And it's been one of those really nice things to be a part of. And selfishly, I mean, obviously for you, I hope you are successful and this podcast continues to grow. But for me, on a very selfish note, I kind of hope it doesn't grow because I love the size of the community. And once it gets too big, it becomes a little bit difficult. Um, but I just, I love the size of the community, the people that are in the community, the way it's grown. It's It's been a lot of, of fun to be a part of yeah no uh, th th thanks and i mean like it uh the thanks goes to people like you who are part of that community that are making it like that uh you know like we can't make the community be the community it's just not we, we don't we're not that influential we don't have that power so it's kind of like hey here's a place everybody just kind of be nice and then people have come in and been nice so it's like good like we haven't had to really discipline anybody or do anything like that, which is great. Um, and I think it's all self-moderated in a sense. I mean, we do pay Dwarf uh, $0 an hour to moderate for us and he's happy to do it. Uh, but, uh, you know, we haven't had to stick him on penny. anyone. Yeah, he, he is. Yeah, you get what you pay for. So, I mean, you you don't see it. You don't realize what I have to do. But at 3 o'clock in the morning, our time, Dwarf actually does post nudes in our Discord, <laughs> which I then have to go ahead and time him out for about a day and remove them all. Um, so Are they his nudes? Yeah, be a good human. <laughs> but... <laughs> Uh, yeah, but uh, no, no, in all seriousness, I, again, I appreciate it. I appreciate you taking the time to come on and have a chat with us and share your, you know, your experiences and your thoughts and all that kind of stuff. Because, uh, you know, one of the things that we never thought of when we kind of started doing this and we had this idea of like, Hey, we like rambling. I wonder if we could record it and put it on the internet, right? Like that's a thing. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we, I never really thought that someone was like, Hey, can I also ramble with you? Like, you know, I've been listening to you for a year and a half. Like, can I tell you about my rambles? Cause that's, I love meeting people. That's just one of my jams is just kind of meeting people and hearing their stories. And, uh, it's really cool that we can get people to come in and kind of share that their, their experiences with us. So thanks again. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Clearly I enjoy rambling as well. So thanks for giving me the, <laughs> giving me the opportunity to do that. And before we get into the last thing, I just want to point out one final thing that I really enjoy about your podcast is that you started a podcast and the name of it is Amdur, which is a master's degree in rolling terribly. And the first game that you chose to highlight is a game where you do not roll, you flip. Yeah, look. Yeah. One of the first many, many mistakes that we have made, yes. <laughs> Just even in the name. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, so yeah. we are. Uh, I will close this out. So, yeah, I've been Teddy. I've been joined again by Gaz. And of course, Spitting Drake Dang. And when it comes to rolling terribly, it's all in the flip.